How are we all doing? I'm Greg Roscoff. I'm the owner and developer of Muscle Activation Techniques. Uh, thank you all for being here. I know we're all kind of hitting some, some tough times with, with everything going on in, in society right now. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time to, to be here for this, this broadcast. Uh, just really want to get some, give you some history and, and get you to gain a, an understanding of muscle activation techniques and how it can fit in with what you do. Uh, today we, we have this, uh, pro this program for licensed practitioners. And so basically physical therapists, chiropractors, massage therapists, athletic trainers, basically uh, licensed practitioners that, I mean, you, you all have your own field. You all have your own um, uh, field of skill. And, and I want to show how muscle activation techniques can actually be an adjunct uh, to what you do, regardless of whether it's you working with the technique or um, having somebody uh, that you refer to that works with the technique. And, and really seeing where it fits in the big picture. Uh, it's probably one of the greatest things I've seen is, is uh, I mean, we do, we do one thing with MAT. We basically, I mean, improve, I mean, look at uh, muscle dysfunction. And from a neuromuscular standpoint, our whole goal with MAT is to improve the function of the, of the neuromuscular system. And so literally that's the specialty. And um, I'll say because we are talking with licensed practitioners today, um, I, I have my degree in, um, with an emphasis in exercise science, a master's degree with an exercise, in exercise science. So I don't have the license to diagnose or treat pain. What I do, coming from the exercise science standpoint, I, I have the ability to, to look at muscle function. And, and that kind of leads into why I'm here in the first place. Uh, um, I had a fractured vertebrae when I was 19, and I had a lot of residual problems and, uh, over, over the years. And, and I mean, literally by the time I was 25 years old, I had patella femoral syndrome, plantar fasciitis, SI joint dysfunction, I literally had one injury after another, and by the time I was 25 years old, I'm thinking, man, if I'm this bad at 25, what am I going to be like uh, when I'm 50? And so, so that put me on a quest, kind of the, the fractured vertebrae in itself. I, I was playing football in college, and I, and I had to sacrifice my last year of eligibility in football. Um, and then I got a job as a strength and conditioning coach at Fresno State in California. And so I was in the field. I was dealing with muscle function, performance, and strength and conditioning. And I mean, that's all I knew really at that point in my career. And then I decided while I was working as a strength coach to get my master's with the emphasis in exercise science. And it was interesting because uh, what I was learning and doing on a day-to-day -day basis as a strength and conditioning coach, um, kind of, I didn't have a lot of cross-referencing between what I was learning at nighttime as I was getting my a master's degree in exercise science. And so I, I was like, okay, I, I mean, it was interesting because this is back in the 80s, from, I mean, 85, I, I basically got my, uh, I started as a strength coach. And, and even back then, we didn't really uh, look at the muscle system's role in chronic pain or injury. When I was working with, as a strength coach, if guys were injured, they'd go to the training room. And uh, when they were healthy, they'd come back. And so uh, they would get them back in the weight room, and then they could start doing their performance work. And back then in the, in the 80s, there wasn't a lot of communication between the, the, the rehabilitation, the athletic training department, and the uh, performance, the sports performance side of it. And then again, like I was saying, is then I'm getting my master's degree at night in exercise science and learning about conduction and nerve impulses and, and I mean, biomechanics of movement and uh, the physiology and, and doing physiological testing on our athletes. But I, it really didn't correlate with, okay, we're going to set somebody up on a strength and conditioning program. What do we do? How do we set them up? I mean, what's the right exercise? And, and how do you know? And it, it kind of seemed like it was more makeshift. But, okay, we're going to do some power lifts and um, strength training today, and we're going to do more endurance work in another day. And, and it was kind of programming with no real rhyme or reason to it. Uh, I mean, there's people specializing in the field, but it was like, well, what is the scientific rationale behind what we're trying to do? And so it was interesting because I had all these variations, working at getting my master's degree, uh, working as a strength and conditioning coach of the day and tying in with the athletic trainers. But the, the thing that sat out the whole time is I, was, I had a fractured vertebrae. 
And I was having all these residual problems as I was um, as I was trying to progress in, in, in my field. And so then I started focusing on the athletes that were, if you want to say, dysfunctional, the, the more injury prone athletes, and started realizing that, man, I mean, most of the time when you're working with college athletics, when you set them up on exercise programs, I mean, they get bigger, faster, stronger, and I mean, it, basically the follow process is pretty ideal and, and pretty consistent. But then there's certain people that didn't have the success, certain people that would break down. And those were the people I focused on because it seemed like they were they were like the, the injury prone person that the trainers were kind of blown to the side because they were always injured. But I was that guy. I was that guy and I'm sitting here like, I mean, what's wrong with me? And I, I could relate to these athletes that were always getting injured. And so so I started looking deeper into it and, and trying to understand why, why do some people get bigger, faster, stronger with an exercise program and other people end up breaking down. And, and so I kind of looked at my whole um, history and started looking at, uh, I, mean, I had the fractured vertebrae. A fracture should heal in six weeks. And so in a six week period, I'm, I'm years later and I'm still having these residual problems. And these residual problems to me all seem muscular. Like the fracture should have healed in six to eight weeks. And so uh, I was, I mean, I could barely stand up and get out of bed certain days and it seemed more like it was a muscular issue. And so I started looking at the muscle system's role and, and what it had to do with chronic pain and injury. And I started looking at the interrelationships of joints and how the foot, the ankle, the knee, the hip, and the trunk, and how everything was interrelated. And, and how if you had abnormal motion in one joint, it could put increased stress on joints and tissues up the chain. And so I started seeking out specialists that kind of I mean, came from that background. There was uh, Richard Jackson was a physical therapist I worked with in Fresno back right after I was a strength and conditioning coach. Uh, he looked at biomechanics and movement and top health girdle mobilization techniques and SI joint uh, techniques and uh, spinal manipulation or mobilization technique. I was able to learn conceptually um, the, how physical therapists looked at biomechanics. And then there was a, I mean, basically the king of function, his name was Gary Gray, uh, who basically came out with functional movement, functional movement training in, in the physical therapy world. And I was able to learn from him early on. So I was having the access to learn from some great, ironically, some great therapists early on in my career. And I became the biomechanic specialist dealing with the exercise side of it with people with pain and injury. And so the interesting part is as I progressed, I started seeking out the any specialist that had a, a background in, um, in biomechanics that looked at the interrelationships of joints and, and understood that if somebody has knee pain, it's not necessarily a knee issue and or back pain, that you have to look at the whole integrated system to see where the dysfunction is. And so I was able to learn from some great specialists. And the interesting part about all of it, it was the common denominator from every specialist out there, from chiropractic to physical therapy to podiatry uh, to massage therapy, the common denominator from every field out there was muscle tightness was the cause of the dysfunction. And so wherever you have been, basically, if you had limitations in range of motion in one joint or, or tissue, and you'll have, the body would go and pick up that motion somewhere else that provided that motion in, in that particular plane. And so, so that basically, you could have have abnormal motion in your lower leg and foot and end up having knee pain or SI joint dysfunction uh, because the body's compensating for the limitation in range of motion. And so I went through this whole process. And as I went through this process, I, I mean, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning about the interrelationships of joints and how everything's integrated. And then I'm learning techniques from Gary Gray. And, and I became this functional range of motion guy. So not only was I trying to figure things out for myself for selfish reasons, but I was, I mean, helping my career. I was helping to progress myself in my career. And so I developed a whole field where I was working with through the biomechanics and movements and working with people and trying to improve their performance, looking at the interrelationships of joints and literally being this range of motion, functional movement um, program, I guess you'd say from an exercise programming standpoint. And I was having success doing functional movement patterns with, with people and identifying where their limitations and range of motions were. And I would, I mean, I would have success in applying these techniques to the point it got me hired with the Utah Jazz um, through the Stockton Malone era. 
And so in the late 80s, or early 90s, I can't even remember, I got hired to the, for the last 10 years of working with the Utah Jazz through that Stockton and Malone era. And so I got hired at Pro Sports working with that mentality. There, wherever you see limitations in range of motion, you want to increase the mobility. And I had various techniques through contract relax techniques and mobilization techniques that I had learned through the therapists that worked with. And, and, uh, literally, um, and then combined it with functional movement and functional training and had success. And got, like I said, got hired at the professional level. But then there was one problem myself personally. Every time I would stretch to get deep tissue massage, I couldn't get out of bed the next day you know, with numbness and sciatica down into my big toe. And so I would sit there and literally look at it from an idea is what's wrong with me? I'm 25 years old, I'm doing all the right things that, that I'm working with with high level athletes to improve their performance and prepare them for their sport. But as I apply these principles to me, it, it wasn't working. And and so it was, I mean, like I said, what am I going to be like when I'm 50? I'm as bad at 25. And so I, I just kept trying to figure out. And then literally, I'm going to switch you on to a, a presentation from this point. You'll be able to see me in the screen with the PowerPoint presentation. And we're just going to go through, like, this is what led me to the development of MAT. The frustration that I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And so... I'm going to basically go through this presentation. I've talked about the history. I was a functional range of motion guy. And, um, and literally, the whole aspect is I was, I mean, I would stretch and strengthen. I mean, functional exercise through strengthening exercises. And I followed a lot of principles. I'm Vladimir Janda, I mean, his principles with upper and lower cross syndrome. And I would actually look at um, upper and lower cross syndrome and see, like, oh, well, I mean, you see this anterior pelvic tilt, the uh, lower cross syndrome, anterior pelvic tilt, where the hip flexors and erectors are tight and the glutes and abdominals are weak. And we do stretches for the tight muscles and uh, strengthening exercises for the weak muscles. In six weeks, eight weeks later, they're still standing there with that lower dotted posture and, and that lower cross syndrome. And myself, I was like, well, this, it wasn't having a positive impact. Um, on my own, from my own personal postural abnormalities. And so I realized everything that I was doing was more protocol based. And it's like, well, maybe it goes a little deeper than this. And this idea that the tight, you have to loosen up the tight muscles and strengthen the weak muscles didn't always result in the results we would hope for. And so literally, again, I'm sitting there like, what's wrong with me? And so I kind of took a step back and working at the pro sport level and and had the, the um, opportunity to work with the chiropractor of the Utah Jazz who uh, did clinical kinesiology and um, which involves muscle testing and he would I mean we would work together and work with John Stockton and, and um, we do the, the, the work I do my range of motion techniques or identify range of motion do my stretching um, range of motion modalities and, and do strengthening exercises and he'd do his clinical kinesiology work and we'd work together and it was interesting because I was always focusing on the tightness but I wasn't getting better and so then I asked myself, I took a step back and like, why do muscles tighten up? And you think about it from a, from a neurological standpoint, um, when we walk on ice, what's the first thing we do, we do when we walk on ice? We tighten up as a protective mechanism. So the natural neurological response is when the body senses instability, it tightens up as a protective mechanism. And you think about it from a neurological standpoint, the minute you step off the ice, all your protective mechanisms go away. And so maybe in my mind, maybe this tightness is secondary to some underlying instability issue. And, and, and I would say and a weakness would be the term I would use. But it was interesting because I'm, I was working out. I was a strength coach. I was squatting 500 pounds, bench pressing 400 pounds when I was playing football in college. And uh, nobody could have told me that I was weak. And, um, but there was, what is this weakness? Or, or instability issue me and the, is, uh, when you walk on ice there's an instability issue um, but I couldn't blame this on weakness so I couldn't correlate what does instability mean 
And then I started work as I worked with the chiropractor from the Utah Jazz, and he would identify muscle weaknesses through clinical kinesiology testing. It correlated. I mean, literally, there was an eye-opening moment one day. I was working on John Stockton, and we were he was limited in 90-90 hip internal rotation. And I stretched out his external rotators, his range of motion improved. And the chiropractor, Craig Bueller, came back and tested some extra internal rotators. And, and um, all of a sudden, the muscles that weren't weak prior to me stretching him were now weak. And he turned to me and said, what did you just do? Like, what did you do? You just, I mean, you just made him weak. And <laughs> I'm sitting here like thinking, oh, man, that can't be a good thing. And so I started looking deeper at that. Wow, he just tested the muscle to be able to show that the work that I just did actually caused weakness in John Stockton's body. And that can't be a good thing. And so as I look deeper into this, I mean, and weakness from a neurological standpoint, like I said, it doesn't mean you're weak, you can't bench press or, or squat weight. It means you're weak from a neuromuscular standpoint. And I started recognizing that whenever you have stress, trauma, or overuse, the resultant inflammation alters the communication between the nervous system and the muscle system. And at the point where those muscles just can't contract and they can't contract on demand. It's like having loose battery cables. When the nervous system sends the muscles and it's just not getting to the muscles, so those muscles can't do their job. They're not contracting on demand and firing the way they're designed to. So they can't do their job to stabilize joint and protect the body from injury. And so that was when I realized this is an instability issue. There's a muscle weakness when we do muscle testing from a neuro, neurological standpoint. There is a weakness that the body has to compensate for. And typically that's what happens is when you have altered communication, you have certain muscles that get in proper input um, from the nervous system and they're gonna be able to fire and fire on demand. And the ones that aren't getting proper input, i.e. the loose battery cables, they're a little bit more sluggish, so they can't contract in demand. So literally the ones that can contract are the ones that jump in and do their job. And that's what we call compensation. Uh, compensation is basically where the body's gonna get from point A to point B most efficiently with what it has to work with. And so if muscles can't fire on demand, the, one that can, the ones that can fire on demands are the ones that are going to get you from point A to point B. And it may not be uh, the most efficient way to get there, but we're going to get there. In the same manner, when you're squatting or when you're bench pressing or I mean, working out with weights or playing a sport like golf, um, the body's going to use what it can use. The muscles that aren't getting proper input from the nervous system will be able to fire on demand. The ones that are are not going to. And then when you do strengthening exercises, through, and you're, you end up strengthening these compensation patterns, where the strong get stronger and the weak stay weak, and you end up magnifying the imbalances. And that's what I started realizing as I got away from the athletic uh, industry and started seeing clients who were a little bit more complicated. The, the integrity of the neural muscular system wasn't as high as these high level athletes. It was like, well, they, uh, athletes can compensate. And athletes are great at compensating for, for their instabilities or their weaknesses. But people with less, I mean, when the integrity of someone's nervous system is, is declining, and their neuromuscular system can't fire on demand, all of a sudden they, they can't compensate anymore. They, they get to a certain point where they don't have enough strong muscles to compensate for their weak muscles. And that's when parent Pandora's box opens up. And so as I started recognizing now, muscle weakness wasn't about I couldn't squat or bench press. Muscle weakness was the idea that I had an instability issue. And this instability issue was basically saying, I mean, was being dictated by how I lived my life working out. I was wearing knee wraps when I squatted. I had orthotics to support my arch. I had I wore weight belts and more elbow wraps. I was using artificial support mechanisms to try and create the internet, the stability that the muscles should be providing. And so I was using external devices to do what the intrinsic muscle system should be doing. Because when muscles, when you have tight battery cables or all proper communication between the nervous system and the muscle system, and the muscles can fire and fire on demand, they can do their job to stabilize joints through motion and through movement. What I was, I was strong, but I was unstable. And that was the reason that my fractured vertebrae led to the telephomoral syndrome, plantar fasciitis, SI joint dysfunction, literally one injury after another. And I can say from that standpoint, I was like, what am I going to be like when I'm 50? that all the aches and pains that we relate to aging have to do with failure of the muscle system. I'm 56 years old now doing things I couldn't do when I was 25 because I'm not in chronic pain. And I don't need artificial support 
to provide stability to my joint because the muscles can do their job to stabilize joints through movement. And that's really the foundation and what led to the development of MAT. And so what is MAT? MAT is a biomechan biomechanically based process designed to identify and correct muscle imbalances that contribute to chronic pain and injury. And they also basically, as you improve these muscle imbalance, can contribute to improved performance and, and whatever you're trying to do in life and in, in movement and sports, whatever that may be. And again, I brought it up earlier, whenever you have stress, trauma, or overuse, the resultant inflammation alters the communication between the nervous system and the muscle system, so the muscles just can't fire the way they're designed to fire. Inflammation is the cause behind all this. Inflammation alters the communication between the nervous system and the muscle system. So when we have an injury, when we have overuse, that leads to this dysfunctional movement pattern. We know it. If somebody sprains an ankle, they, they can't put weight on their ankle. They have to limp. And yes, we have an ankle sprain and the ligament's been, been damaged because the soft tissue, the muscle system that has the contractile ability to stabilize joint, the tolerance tolerance levels of those muscles got exceeded. And when the tolerance level of the muscles get exceeded, inhibition occurs and the weak, now the muscles are actually weak. They can't tolerate the forces and now you're actually limp because, I mean, because of the dysfunction in the muscle system. And as the muscles get stronger, the ligament can strengthen and all of a sudden you can recover from a, from a sprained ankle. And so it's all about tightening these battery cables. I've been with the Denver Broncos for 23 years and there's so many times when guys sprain an ankle, They'll come in and all the muscles that support the ankle are, are testing weak uh, because they're not getting proper communication from the nervous system. To get those muscles activated, all of a sudden they can walk on the ankle. There's less of a limp because now those muscles can tolerate greater amounts of force. It actually speeds up the healing process because the muscles are what move joints and muscles stay, move bones and muscles hold bones in proper alignment. So if the muscles aren't firing properly, they can't hold the bones in proper alignment and they can't support the joint. Whenever we have injuries and the result in inflammation, those muscles get weaker from a neurological and, and a strength standpoint. So the goal with MAT is to identify where these altered communication pathways are and tighten the battery cable. So now I'm going to just show you both sides of the puzzle. And I've talked about athletes and, and even my own progression. And here's a woman, a diabetic that had a kidney transplant. Um, and she was dysfunctional and she was in chronic pain. And we talk about movement and I'm gonna zero in on here. We talk about movement. And this is the woman when she came in. I said, she said, I mean, when she tries to pick up her kids or bend over, she can't, she can't get up. She can't get off the ground. So this is the woman when she came in trying to stand up. She said the body will get from point A to point B most efficiently with what we have to work with. She's using anything and everything she can to try and stand up. Any muscle that can help her stand up, will, will, she'll use to stand up. So she's, I mean, that's a lot of effort. The ironic part is, I mean, the, when we're dysfunctional, the body has to work harder to get from point A to point B. So this woman was chronically tight. And she had stretching programs that she was put on through her therapy and she would stretch every day, but she was chronically tight. And what we found that tightness relates to weakness. That tightness was an instability issue. So we basically, she had muscles in her core, muscles in her hip, and we went through and got those muscles activated. And immediately, this is her the same day. Look how much more efficiently she can stand up. All we did was tighten battery cables, identify where these altered communication pathways were, got those muscles activated, tightened battery cables, reestablished the communication between the nervous system and the muscle system. And there she goes from not being able to stand up to being able to stand up efficiently. Now, the interesting thing about this is, I mean, she was tight and she was stretching every day. She had a home program that she was done, given to her uh, rehabilitation. She was stretching every day. So the interesting part was I had her here, uh, here, after I got muscles activated, then I had her go through her stretching routine. She went through her stretching routine and this was her after she stretched. She was like that before, we got her muscles activated and she, and basically what she did is she went and put forces on her body. And those forces exceeded the tolerance levels of her muscular system. 
So actually the forces, the, the exercises and stretches that she was doing on a day-to-day -day basis was actually exceeding her tolerance level and actually making her weak. And so literally the, my office was upstairs the first day. It took her probably five minutes to get upstairs. We stopped her stretching and exercise program for the time being. And this was her walking up the stairs every day from that point forward. This was the start of her, her coming back to health. And now the point is, it's not to say that stretching is bad, but there's a place. And how do we know whether when we put force on the body, whatever that force is, how do we know whether or not it had a positive or a negative effect? The nice thing is, I mean, it showed up to her function, but most people aren't that blatant in the way they display their dysfunction. Um, and so the nice part is, is we can identify. We can actually go through, I laid her back on the table, a range of motion, tighten back up after she stretched, ironically. She actually tightened back up and she was weaker. And so basically we got the muscles activated again and sent her home like this, took away her putting forces on her body on a day-to-day -day basis and provided an environment so her body could heal. And that's the goal with anyone with an injury, with, with neuromuscular dysfunction like this. The whole goal is we want to provide an environment so their tissues can heal. And many times we continue to put forces on people's bodies through application of forces, through stretching, deep tissue massage, exercise, dry needling. I mean, there's so many forces that we put on people's body designed to try and loosen up or relax tissues when literally those forces can actually have a negative effect. Can the body tolerate forces? The forces that are being applied to the body is the biggest question that we have to ask. I go back to myself, and every time I would stretch or get deep tissue massage, I couldn't get out of bed the next day. And prior to my accident, prior to fracturing my vertebrae, I stretched and got deep tissue massage all the time, and there was never negative effect. So it's not that the, the product is bad. It's that the, I mean, it's the person that it's being applied on. Can their muscles and can their tissues tolerate the forces you're putting on them? And this woman was showing she couldn't. And so... That's basically where we're at. I mean, MAT takes an in-depth look at anatomy and kinesiology, muscle function. I'm a muscle specialist. I don't have the license to diagnose or treat pain, but I understand the muscle system's role and how it relates to chronic pain and injury. So MAT takes an integrated, basically looks at, sorry, that's written wrong. MAT looks at the integrated system and breaks it down into its isolated parts. We are only as strong as our weakest link. So muscle by muscle, movement by movement, we go through people's body to determine how do you move? Because I don't care what you can do, I wanna know what you can't do. Because what you can't do is breaking you down. If you turn your head to the right and you say, oh, I can't turn my head to the right, but I can turn it all the way left, it means that the muscles that turn your head, that contract the shorten to turn your head to the right, for whatever reason, are not contracting efficiently. So the opposite muscles tighten up. And so we look at that idea is every muscle and division of muscle in the body has its own set of battery cables. It has, each muscle has its own communication pathway. So the integrated system is only as good as the function of its isolated parts. And we're only as strong as our weakest link. And so we want to look at sometimes with athletes, you can identify where the weak link is and there's just few weak links through the body. But the more and more dysfunctional we get as we age and we have an accumulation of stresses, uh, the more, I mean, more and more muscles become dysfunctional to the point where I said earlier, and you get to the point where you no longer have enough strong muscles to compensate for the weak muscles. So you look at this with the infraspinatus, there's, I mean, literally three different divisions of the infraspinatus and then the teres minor, which are all external rotators um, of the humerus. And we, here we have the inferior fibers. Each one of those divisions of the muscles have a different function, a different priority and function. And when, if I was looking at the teres minor, I would be ex it would externally ro rotate my arm in an abductive position. As I move up to the superior division of the infraspinatus, the angle of abduction changes. And so every muscle has its own set of battery cables. So the first thing we have to do is identify, is, are these battery cables connected? Is, the proper, is there proper communication between the nervous system and the muscle system? Because if I have a weakness down here, and all the other muscles in that the external rotate the humerus are strong, um, then I want to make sure that once I jumpstart the muscle that I focus on the weakness here and not do exercises here because, again, that's, I'm already strong there. I don't care what you can do. We want to know what you can't do. And through our assessment process with MAT, we can identify which battery cables are loose. And so 
Real quick, we're not going to get deep into the physiology, but it's all about sensory input. When I'm talking the communication between the nervous system and the muscle system, it all comes down to sensory input. And we're looking at the muscle spindle and the sensitivity of the muscle spindle when we're identifying whether or not we have these neuromuscular weaknesses. And if you look at the top part of that screen, you have basically extrafusal fibers and intrafusal fibers. The interfusal fibers, are, you have the coil around it. That's the 1A fern axis that goes back to the motor neuron in the spinal cord. And so you look at the top schematic, and that shows a muscle that's um, being lengthened. And the, extra, the extrafusal fiber on the left is lengthened. The interfusal fiber lengthens along with it. And that sends sensory feedback, creates constant sensory feedback back to the central nervous system. In the second schematic, you have a muscle, you have input coming from the motor neuron in the spinal cord, or basically electrical current coming to create a muscle contraction of the extrafusal fiber. If there's not a reciprocal contraction of the intrafusal fiber, see how that intrafusal fiber goes under slack. So basically, that coil is in the slacked area of the intrafusal fiber. And if you look at the readings, the, the electrical recordings on the side, there's a gap, there's a flat spot where there's no spikes. That's because at that point, as that intrafusal fiber shortens, because there's no tension on the intrafusal fiber, there's no electrical current. There's no feedback back to the central nervous system. So through this process of alpha gamma coactivation through higher centers, the gamma motor neurons, um, it's um, stimulated in, in the spinal cord, which in turn maintain the tension on the intrafusal fiber. So that bottom um, schematic shows that there's a contraction of the of the extrafusal fiber, but the, through alpha gamma coactivation, the gamma motor neuron is stimulated, which in turn creates a contraction of the inter, intrafusal fiber, which in turn maintains tension. There's no longer slack on that intrafusal fiber. And if you look at the electrical recordings on the right hand side of that, it's like there's constant feedback, there's constant electrical current. So the problem is number two. The middle schematic shows that, that when there's slack on the intrafusal fiber, there's no electrical activity. When you have stress, trauma, and overuse, the resultant inflammation alters the communication between the nervous system and the muscle system. It alters, it re reduces the sensitivity of the muscle spindle to the point where you lose the alpha gamma coactivation, you lose the gamma aspect of alpha gamma coactivation, and the intrafusal fiber goes under slack. When that intrafusal fiber goes under slack, there you cannot create a muscle contraction. And that's what happens when you have stress, trauma, or overuse. So if we look at reciprocal inhibition, I'm monitoring my time here. If we look at reciprocal inhibition, when a muscle contracts, it sends feedback back to the central nervous system. You see the muscle spindle is basically being uh, stimulated. You see one AA per an action or A per an um, feedback, it goes back to the motor neuron in the spinal cord, which in turn reinforces the contraction of the associated muscle, so it reinforces the contraction of the muscle, it's shortening. But you also see a, 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 um, the black um, interneuron is basically an inhibitory interneuron, the, the uh, synapses with the alpha motor neuron of the antagonist muscle. What do you think an inhibitory interneuron does? It tells the motor neuron of the antagonist muscle to relax, inhibit. Because if this muscle is to contract, if my bicep is going to contract and, the, and there's proper feedback, there has to be an inhibitory response to the antagonist muscle to allow that muscle to contract through its full range of motion. And so reciprocal inhibition is a normal process of muscle function. When you have stress, trauma, or overuse, your muscles lose, this communication pathway gets altered. So the intrafusal fiber goes under slack. So the muscle spindle is no longer providing proper feedback to stimulate the alpha motor neuron of the associated muscle, the bicep. So the bicep can't contract efficiently. And when the bicep can't contract efficiently, you also lose the inhibitory response going, up, going to the antagonist muscle. So the antagonist muscle doesn't inhibit. So as you lose the ability for one muscle to contract and shorten effectively, the opposite muscle will not lengthen effectively. So the opposite muscle shows up as being tight. In my experience and the work that I did up until I developed MAT, I focused on the tightness. And the problem was is this tightness is a result of the underlying weakness, the instability or the altered communication. When you have stress, 
some are overused. Intrafusal fibers carry slow twitch characteristics. And when you have stress, trauma, or overuse, the resultant inflammation alters the communication between and basically changes the metabolic characteristic of slow twitch muscle fibers in the main way that they end up having a higher threshold to activation. But you saw when that interfusal fiber goes under slap, there's no motor output. There's no feedback to the nervous system to create, to create a motor response. So the further and further a muscle moves in this shortened position, when you have altered communication, the less sensory feedback goes back to the central nervous system to the point where it's almost paralyzed. And that's why muscles tighten up. It's a natural neurological perspective, or a natural neurological uh, protective mechanism that says, I'm not going to let you move in the position where you're unstable. You're basically paralyzed there. We put forces on that tissue that when you cannot create any counter um, can muscle contraction, you're vulnerable. You're vulnerable for injury. And so tightness. From an MAT perspective, we look at tightness as part of the protective mechanism for some underlying instability. When muscles lose the ability to shorten effect or contract efficiently, they lose the ability to shorten effectively. And so that's the process. And from a neurological and biomechanical standpoint, we actually in a lengthened position where the strongest neurologically and uh, I mean, neuro, from a neurological standpoint, biomechanically, at 90 degree force angle, that's where we're the strongest due to act and myosin cross bridging. But if there's inhibition, we're at a biomechanical and a neurological disadvantage in the most shortened position of a muscle. The body will protect you from moving into a position of vulnerability. When I was finding what the interesting part was for years, right? I mean, I tried to stretch and try and loosen up my hamstrings, and I could barely dent, bend down to touch my knees. And I never got any more flexible. And you've probably all seen it where people stretch and you do mobility work and everything and they come back and they're just as tight as they've ever been because we haven't melted the ice. The goal with muscle activation techniques is to melt the ice, provide a sense of stability, and the body will give you all the mobility in the world. And the first time that I got my abdominal muscles and hip flexors activated through a person I was training, we, we activated my abdominals and, and hip flexors, the opposite muscles of the hamstring. They're the muscles that couldn't shorten and contract fully into the shortened range. Those were the muscles that got traumatized when I had the fractured vertebrae and that I had to compensate for for years. When we got the abdominals and the hip flexors um, activated, I bent down and I touched my toes for the first time in 10 years. And I could barely touch my knees up to that point. And that was the day I was sold. That was the day I realized that Wherever I see a limitation in range of motion, it means that one or more of the muscles that move you in that position are potentially weak. And the restricted muscles, the tight muscles, are the muscles that are tightening up to protect you from moving in to that position of weakness or that position of vulnerability. And I literally, I was already hired at the professional level. I'm working with the Utah Jazz and the Denver Broncos. I'm there full time with the Denver Broncos for the two Super Bowl years. And I had this functional range of motion focus um, practice that got me hired at that level. And I realized there's some flaws, there's some vulnerabilities. Uh, that, I mean, the nice thing is, I mean, athletes adapt, you can put forces on their body. And like I said, I could stretch and get massage prior. So it worked in that realm. It worked at high level of sports. But once you get to that woman, people like that woman that are dysfunctional, that's when it's like, we need a plan B. And I realized the principles that I had put together for athletes weren't as sound and full proof when I tried to take them over into the normal population. And that's where MAT comes in. We, whenever you, you have to have stability in order to have mobility. So I literally, I created a paradigm shift. I literally changed my whole perspective. It basically, and that's the for a foundation is muscle tightness is secondary to weakness. The title of this, uh, lecture was muscle tightness is muscle weakness because it is muscle tightness is the result of muscle weakness when muscles lose the ability to contract efficiently they lose the ability to shorten effectively and when muscles lose the ability to shorten effectively they opposite muscles show up as being tight and so the tightness is a symptom related to the weakness from an mat perspective and so you need, this is an alter, it's a, it basically gives a plan B, another way to look at the body. It doesn't say anything else that we're doing is wrong. I mean, people are having success. I worked with Michael Leahy, who developed that ART, worked with massage therapists, chiropractors, and, and physical therapists for the 23 years that I've been working with the Denver 
the Broncos, and we all work together, and everybody has its place. But there's one thing I do know. If you have mobility without stability, you have vulnerability for injury. With muscle activation techniques, anytime that we increase range of motion, we want to make sure you're stable through that range of motion. And that's all we're testing. And just make sure okay you're more mobile because you just got stretched out or increased your motion. Let's just make sure you're stable through that range because we don't want mobility without stability. When you have mobility without stability, you have vulnerability for injury. And again, wherever you see a limitation in range of motion, it tells you that one or more of the muscles that move you into that position are potentially weak. So that's I'm going to passively take them into some positions just because that's I mean kind of what I can do with athletes and relax. You got to get. And relax is like, okay, I mean, there's his hip flexion. He's kind of pretty tight there. And I hope I don't block the screen too much. Relax. Might be a little tighter on that side. Yeah. Seem tight, <laughs> seem tight on the, the right side. Um, but actually, and I didn't check him before this. Uh, and I want to put a little perspective. So, so Zach is 24 years old right now. So he's tighter in hip flexion on his left side when I check him passively to assess his range of motion and hip flexion. But I'm going to tell a little story before I take this into the next phase. Zach came home. He was about 17 years old. He was playing basketball on a Sunday. He thought he landed on somebody weird. He thought he tore his ACL. My wife took him to urgent care, and they ruled out ACL tear. He comes home on crutches. My wife tells me the whole story. He's up in his room and said, well, as long as uh, they ruled out that he had an ACL, um, and it's muscular. There's a, there's, there's a muscular component to it. And he literally comes down on crutches. I said, let's check it out. He comes down on crutches. And when he gets off the crutches, he can't put any weight on his leg. And he hops on the table. I check his range of motion. And he can't bend his knee more than about 20 degrees. And it's painful. And so muscles move bones. And muscles hold bones in proper alignment. He did not have an ACL tear. We ruled that that part was ruled out. What, what can he do? He couldn't flex his knee. So I went through to just the conventional MAT process, the muscles that shorten, any muscle that crosses the axis, the hamstrings from the semi-membranosus, the semi-tendinosus, notices the uh, bicep femoris, sartorius, gracilis. I mean, there's many muscles that cross the knee joint that have a component of motion in, in knee flexion. We tested and treated all the muscles that had to do with knee flexion, and immediately, on the spot, he almost had full range of motion in knee flexion. And this was the around, he was 17 years old, and kind of like I said earlier, you can do anything wrong with athletes and still have success with athletes. 17 years old, he has full range of motion now. He stands up and he starts to live, and he, all of a sudden he walks and he goes, oh my God, that feels so much better. I didn't know this at the time. The next day I go, let's check again, see how you're doing. He goes, oh, I'm, I'm doing great. And he goes, I went and played basketball last night. He went from coming home on crutches and not being able to put any weight on his knee, and I wouldn't have recommended it, and we got to the point where he could put weight on it and bear weight because the muscles are what, I mean, tolerate the loads. We got the muscles reactivated, improved the communication. Immediately, he had range of motion because he had strength, because he had tightened battery cable. He ended up going and playing basketball that night. We rechecked him the next day. All the muscles were still strong, and we never looked back. He never looked back. And that's that's the idea. Is this? I mean, when we have injuries, as long as there's no injury to the passive structures, the cartilage, the meniscus, the ace, the ligaments, if there's no damage to the passive structures, then we know it's a muscular issue. And typically, the the main factor that represents that there's a limit or that there's a problem is a limitation in range of motion. And so we just saw a limitation in range of motion and hip flexion on his left side. Turn around the other way so I can stay on this side, put your head up here. So hip flexion, he's limited in hip flexion. This would be considered, perhaps, this would be considered hamstring tightness. He's limited in hip flexion, which is putting increased tension on the hamstring. What are hip flexors? We got psoas major, we got psoas minor, or, I mean, sorry, psoas major. There's three divisions of the psoas major, the iliacus, the iliacus minor, the tension fasciolata. We have adductors that flex the hip. We have adductors that flex the hip. The nice thing about MAT is we have the ability to test every one of them. And I said, I don't care what you can do. I want to know what you can't do because what you can't do is breaking you down. 
I want to know, out of those hip flexors that I just named up, um, can he withstand the force? We take him into the shortened position because if there's, an, if there's a, a problem, the intrafusal fiber goes under slack, there's no sensory input. There'll be positions where he'll be completely weak. Hold up. He's strong there. That's the lumbar division of the psoas major. Okay, that, that's strong. Hold up here. And then he's strong there, which is the uh, thoracic division. Hold up. Then they get to the diaphragmatic division of the psoas major, and he can't resist the thing. I mean, I, the, the more I do it, it's like it's a ratchet, ratchet now. And, and so then I'm going to go to the origin insertion. I'm just going to do this very quickly. We're going to go to the origin insertion of the associated muscle. This is the diaphragmatic division of the psoas major. I want to create a stimulatory effect because vibrational stimulation to the, to the muscle spindle increases the sensitivity of the muscle spindle. We now have his brain focused on the diaphragmatic division of the psoas major. Hold up. As I have him in that position, he, he couldn't resist me at all. Hold up. I mean, now I, have, I would have to push very hard and do a, a break test to see if I could break him down as opposed to a neurological. And when I first tested him, the intrafusal fiber was under slack. I applied a light force, probably 10 pounds of force, and he couldn't withstand that force. In the other test, he was strong. I don't care what you can do, I want to know what you can't do. So now I bring him up and check the other ones. Iliacus, hold it. Iliacus response, oh, oh Iliacus minor, hold up the Oh, we got another one, Iliacus minor. Okay, randomly, which ones are we? I don't know why. People say, well, why is that weak? I don't know. I mean, stress, trauma over you, your body's showing that for whatever reason, you have limited um, commun the communication, you have loose pattern again, the communication pathways. Have been altered. So now I go to the origin insertion of the iliacus minor, bring him up into that position again, hold up and in, and he's strong as can be. But it's hard to tell from the camera, but I'm not pulling harder, pushing harder, because I don't care. The ones that were strong were strong, I move on. The ones that are weak, oh, we have to we have to do something. Tension postulata, two divisions up and out. Tension postulata is good. So in that perspective, right there. There, I don't know if you can tell from where we were before, but his range of motion, he was actually better on the right side than the, the left. And that, worst case scenario, I feel any different. The left side. Yeah. So the left side is a lot looser. I didn't stretch him. I activated, activated the muscles that move him into that short position. I activated those, like I said, there's adductors that flex the hip, there's adductors that flex the hip. Um, there's more that I could account for, but just by looking at muscles that have the primary function of hip flexion, which were the weaknesses were the diaphragmatic division of the psoas, and then the iliacus minor, the other ones I accounted for were all strong. We got those muscles activated immediately, his range of motion improved. I mean, there was tension when I tried to bring his leg up, up earlier. And so we have mobility and stability. Now, if we think of the other alternative, if I was to stretch him prior to and just say, okay, be enough, contract, relax, contract against me, if I'm having him stretch, we may see a change in range of motion, but if we, if we stretch him and we increase his range of motion, how do we know whether he's strong through that range of motion? You can increase mobility, but there's no guarantee that you increase stability. When I show that picture of the reciprocal inhibition, there's a feedback loop that comes from the muscle spindle on the bicep that says if this contracts, we get a reinforcement of input to the, inter or the um, inhibitory interneuron, which in turn allows the tricep to relax. There's not an opposite feedback loop that says if you loosen up the tricep, due to sensory input there, it will improve the contraction of the bicep. So the way that we can guarantee that we have mobility and stability is by testing the muscles, identifying where these altered communication pathways are, get those muscles activated to then improve the stability component, and then with increased stability, the body will give you the mobility. Basically what I did with him is melt the ice. And that's the goal of MAT, provide a sense of stability, the body will give you all the mobility in the world. It helps to speed up the rehabilitation processes. 
It works as an adjunct to every field out there, from chiropractic to physical therapy to training to massage. Um, every, every field, it's, it's an adjunct to, to what you're presently doing. And so I want to thank you all. This is quick you know, information. I want to thank you all for being here and listening to this and, and being even open to the principles of MAT. Um, you know, we have education programs that, that train train through these. You can specialize in body parts. Um, we do have lower body courses that are specific to lower body function, like we just did with him with, um, with hip flexion. We have trunking courses for trunk and spine. Uh, we have shoulder, upper body, shoulder uh, courses, and some of you uh, therapists may be shoulder specialists. Some could be knee specialists. So you can pick the body part when you're a, a licensed practitioner, um, moving through our ed education program. I mean, we have programs, I mean, they're specializing lower leg and feet. Lower leg and feet are one of the most powerful areas of the body because the foot's the first thing that hits the ground and the rest of the body has to respond to what the foot does. And I tell you what, when we look at the orthotic industry, I mean, 90% plus of the people out there are dysfunctional from, from, from the knee down due to wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, shoe wear, orthotics, and, and artificial support to help make up for what the muscles are supposed to do. There's many people that, I mean, you can just be a foot specialist and have success with these techniques. So we have education programs that are available, and I think we're going to be um, uh, posting that on, on the screen for you if you want to find out more about our education opportunity. Uh, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's a powerful tool. It's a great adjunct. And hopefully that I mean, it, it makes you want to uh, look at trying to learn it. Because I tell you what, the best example I have is the day, I mean, when he thought he had an ACL tear, couldn't put any weight on it, and he ended up playing basketball that night. Uh, those, those are examples. And then the woman being able to stand up and changing her quality of life, those, those are examples that I see on a day-to-day -day basis by improving muscle function to improving the communication between the nervous system and the muscle system so people can I mean, so people can heal from injuries, speed up the healing process, so people can perform at a higher level and more than anything, help prevent, help prevent injury. Because the first sign of instability or a problem with um, communication is muscle tightness. The second sign is pain. When you keep putting forces on the tissue that's weak and vulnerable, the body eventually shouts out and saying, quit doing this until you fix the problem. And then shout, and it shouts out on pain. Pain is the end result of muscle dysfunction. There's no pathological issue, no passive tissue structure, the passive tissue issues, then muscle function is the cause of pain. I don't treat pain, I treat muscle function. By improving muscle function, I've seen so many times where pain has been minimized because muscle function has been maximized. There's actually an inverse relationship between mechanoreception and nociception. And basically, when sensitivity of the mechanoreceptors decreases due to stress trauma overuse, i.e., the blunt sensitivity of the muscle spindle, then it takes then the sensitivity of the nociceptors increases, which means it takes less physical stress to create a pain response. When you improve the input from the mechanoreceptors and improve muscle spindle sensitivity, then the sensitivity of the nociceptors decreases, which means now the body can tolerate greater amounts of force before it shuts out in pain. So there's a direct relationship between muscle function and pain. And that's what we do with that muscle activation, is we address muscle function or muscle dysfunction to improve muscle function so the body, the body can heal. Thank you all again. I'm sorry we can't do the question and answers. We have way too many people. I appreciate the fact there's a lot of people on this uh, webinar um, wanting to find out about the principles. So hopefully this helps um, give you answers to the questions of what MAT is about. Thank you again. Have a good day and good luck through this whole coronavirus. And hopefully we get back to normal here in the near future. Have a great day.